thank you. Bon, thank you. I'm chairing this session. Uh, um, I introduce myself, Jean Charles Urcal. I'm involved in this, in this climate affair since uh, the, the 90s. And uh, now we come to the serious things is how to manage the transition to zero carbon, uh, net zero carbon economy in the middle of uh, this century. And uh, we launched uh, in France with Nadia uh, in a chair with the economy and the Ecole des Ponts, a seminar more or less one month, one day per month. And we decide to organize this, 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 this uh, side event. Uh, for understanding, to, for discussing what are the conditions for this huge technical, tra the, uh, technical tr transition of the energy systems. So, Nadia uh, will be the first presenter. She is the leader uh, of this, uh, uh, is uh, of the center on, on, on applied mathematics in, in the Ecole des Mines uh, in France. Uh, we'll have uh, our uh, colleague from Germany, Stefan Nestel de Mauer, that we know each other in the context of the Low Carbon Society Network with a lot of countries. And then I have the pleasure to, we will have the pleasure to have the session the, as a, a, th um, a pre presentation from uh, Hélène de Coninck, who co write with me <laughs> a report on, for the IPCC, uh, the, 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 the IPC report on 1.5, and then we had uh, also right together a report for the Green Climate Fund uh, on the financial, financial implications of the transition. So the idea that uh, 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 Nadia starts, and then, and then Stefan, and then we'll have the comments and the perspective uh, by uh, Hélène. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Charles. Uh, so, um, I will complete my presentation because I don't think that everybody knows me. So, uh, I'm Nadia Maizi. Uh, I'm uh, um, author for IPCC uh, Next Report um, on the chapter on demand. And um, I will focus my presentation today in order to introduce um, the different challenges uh, that are at stake when uh, we consider to introduce high uh, shares of uh, renewable in uh, energy mixes. And uh, I will not uh, concentrate myself on a specific country, uh, but as far as uh, we are French, uh, I will take my um, main uh, examples uh, from uh, the French uh, situation um, and uh, to begin I will um, emphasize uh, the technical issues that uh, we encounter when we deal with this introduction of a uh, high level of uh, renewable energies and uh, here I would like just to show you uh, some uh, uh, prospective exercises that we've conducted in my lab using uh, the times model that we are developing. And uh, you can see here that the more you introduce renewable, the more you have troubles with the, quest the question of uh, the power exchanges. This is just what I want you to focus on, on the uh, right side of this uh, slide. Uh, it's the scenario where in 2050, the target uh, achieved is 100% renewable energy. And you see that we lack of power and then uh, that France would need to import uh, power from its neighbors. And the problem here is that while France can decide its uh, energy policy, the others will decide their energy policy and so um, if everybody uh, is lacking of uh, power, uh, then there will be a great problem. And this is one of the questions that uh, national control level scenarios do not take into account when presenting uh, the result. And uh, another uh, impact that uh, has been um, under considered is the question of reliability uh, that needs to be fulfilled 
at a country level and when you consider the European grid uh, at uh, the European level, uh, where this reliability, I will not take uh, too uh, much time to go into technical details, but uh, roughly speaking, it's the capability of the power system to withstand the sudden disturbances. And this induces the fact that you cannot introduce a share of intermittent renewable sources that is as high as you think, because otherwise you do not fulfill this uh, reliability that we need in order to provide this power uh, at each uh, instant in the grid. So I was talking about the question of imports and here uh, this uh, confirms uh, the results that uh, we didn't see so clearly in the first slide. The fact that this 100% renewable in the power system uh, has consequences in uh, the question of imports and in the scenario that we've presented uh, there is uh, a biomass uh, that uh, becomes a source very important and the question is certainly is this sustainable for France and do we have the resource to fulfill this level of biomass. France is connected, interconnected through uh, the European grid but if we uh, work on uh, levels of island that are not connected there are also consequences in uh, this introduction of high level of renewables which um, concern the question of synchronism and which uh, in fact uh, um, emphasize the fact that when you disperse energy you need to have a more resilient grid in order to fulfill the um, properties of synchronism that are uh, mandatory to operate your grid and uh, this is uh, just uh, to precise what we had as results on another study on La Réunion Island that if we do not provide more uh, lines for the grid then the introduction of this renewable will uh, have uh, some consequences of this, on these uh, reliability issues. And I wanted to go back to this project that everybody uh, has heard about um, and that I think is not completely um, an old project because I think some discussion are still ongoing with uh, uh, some uh, North African countries uh, that do not consider, I think, we think, as far as we know, uh, what was produced uh, these question, uh, uh, technical questions that I've mentioned were not really uh, considered and it also uh, brings the question of climate justice and the fact that be besides these technical scenarios that are usually discussed, they are human in the loop and this is the second point I wanted to raise here, the fact that we need to understand the societal issues that are behind the choices that we make in terms of energy policies and in terms of low carbon scenarios. So I will not come back to the um, Gilets Jaunes uh, mo mo movement that has been um, at the top of uh, the news in France a few years ago and that uh, was expressing the consequences of some policy makers' uh, decisions that were not considering the life size of the people in uh, France that were obliged, that are still obliged to take their car to go to work because there are no other means of transportation. And so the introduction of uh, renewable energy can be also something which is not so compatible, compliant with the life size that uh, people are willing to have or are having. And in order to illustrate this point, I just wanted to um, describe uh, quickly a study that we've conducted in order to understand what would be the future of um, the um, people 
and the consumption of people in France according to different uh, kind of societies. Uh, two options were uh, described, a digital society, more based on individualistic and uh, technology. The people were motivated more by a desire for personal achievement, long life. And another option about uh, this uh, society called collective society, where uh, people were more organized around social connections, cooperation, and the desire to be and to do with others. And the consequences of these uh, different options were assessed by three of my PhD students on different dimensions and uh, specifically on the mobility, the living uh, standards, the question of tourism and so on and so forth. And to provide the results that um, on the uh, on the on the right um, down on the right of the slide, look just at these results that show that we have an increase of the consumption of con different uh, equipment uh, levels in uh, the digital society, and there is really a question about the fact that in order to fulfill this. Um, consumption evolution, uh, renewable energy can or cannot be the right um, sources because they are dispersed and uh, they might not be compatible uh, with uh, any uh, lifestyles uh, that uh, uh, people aim to have in the future. And so, uh, in order just to illustrate this point, I show you here, sorry it's in French, a graph illustrating uh, for different scenarios, introducing high level of uh, renewables that were made by a lot of teams around the world. The fact that there is a correlation with the uh, increase of the final energy demand uh, on the X axis and the uh, power that comes from solar and wind on the y-axis. And this emphasizes the contradiction that I mentioned. So you have a demand that grows in the scenarios where you have more wind and more solar. And to end my um, uh, discussion about these uh, challenges, I would like to raise uh, some externalities issues that sometimes also are under considered. So a lot of uh, discussion comes around the fact that one good solution to decarbonize could be this introduction of high shares of renewables and uh, this will be facilitated uh, by the development of digitalization because it's going to be helpful in order to control and to forecast to control because there will be uh, the context of um, this uh, diluted uh, supply, the question of stabilities I've mentioned, the question of uh, the uh, look for a quality of the signal uh, despite the variability uh, of the sources the question about the cyber security and the resilience that we need to uh, foresee. And uh, in the question of forecast, it's clear because we're talking about solar and wind. So we will need more tools in order to uh, have this operation uh, really doing well. And so the combination between digitalization and renewable energy is uh, usually promoted in the discourse that are in favor of renewables. But in the meantime, a lot of studies uh, say that behind the digital, we have a lot of carbon uh, emission. And uh, here I show you a study that was published by the Semiconductor Industry Association um, that shows that under certain assumption for the scenario of uh, the world energy production. Uh, the consumption dedicated only to computing will cross the line of this world's energy production 
uh, in 2035. So this is something that has to be considered really seriously in order not to bring a solution that can maybe create more problems than uh, it, uh, it solves. And the last point, something that is really well known today, is also the questions of the impact of the development of these renewable sources on the uh, materials that uh, are needed in order to uh, provide the uh, pa pa power uh, panels, solar power panels, and uh, uh, all the elements that are needed uh, for the renewable sources that we are talking about. So this is my point, Jean-Charles. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you. So my, I refer myself to say something because I have, I have a lot of comments, but this is not my role here now. And I will, I will, uh, I think the, the, the what you said fix very well the, some of the big constraints we have to face to pursue this, this, this uh, mob mobilizing utopia of 100% renewable, that's, that's okay, okay. And now we have to, to face that. And now uh, we'll discuss that better after the presentation of Stefan. Hello Stefan, long time we didn't meet ago, but that's fine. You can go. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me and see? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we see you and we hear you. Not yet your, your, okay, your presentation. Okay, so I, I try to share my slides. Um. I'm sorry, I was short in the presentation of uh, each of you. That's, that's my fault because I'm just a bit tired, but, but you can better introduce yourself. Uh, everybody knows that you are German, but I know that you are in, in the Wuppertal and then... <laughs> <laughs> but you can tell you yeah, something. great. Um, that's what I would have said as well. So I'm um, uh, happy to be uh, virtually in Glasgow. Um, I left on, on Sunday because before I also was physically there and um, happy to be in this event. Um, I'm Stefan Lechtenböhmer from Wuppertal Institute working on energy transition with a focus on energy intensive industries, but also more general uh, German en energy transition. And I'm also working as professor in Lund University, Sweden. Uh, so that's to the introduction. And one of the mottos of the Wuppertal Institute is making utopia possible. So that was a good connection to your introduction, Jean-Charles. And um, so can you see my slides already? Or I push this button. What do you see? <laughs> we see exactly what we not full screen, but that's fine. Try and f I'll put f uh, full screen. You have a. You can click somewhere in the uh, at the bottom. At the bottom, you can click. You at the bottom on the right. You will find something. No, I did that. I've, I'm in the present. But you can go that. I mean, we can read. I mean, no. that's okay. That's the, okay. When you can you see the slides? I I I, I go, and I hope. Oh, frankly, no, no, that's fine. Well. Okay, this is the first uh, insight. Um, the, the I was asked to tell something about the insights and challenges for a carbon neutral energy system in Germany. That's on the first slide. And then let's go to the next slide. Uh, introduce briefly, as many may know, Germany has a traditionally a coal by based energy system with rather high greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Still lots of coal there. Um, Germany has a climate neutrality target, and that has been recently updated to 2045 due to a constitutional uh, court ruling. So that's the political background, uh, and we are currently working on, on uh, finding out what that means. Um, luckily, there is a range of scenario studies by different societal groups that recently have analyzed the climate neutral German energy system, some for 2050, some for 25. Uh, and that shows there's a high interest in society. That also shows that there is a discourse, not only among scientists with studies, but uh, these are uh, societal groups, ministries, uh, environmental pressure groups, but also the association of German industries who are uh, um, conducting these studies. Um, and I think there is gradually a common picture emerging on what would be core challenges and central strategies of such a system. I do 
limit that to Germany. We are, of course, also working on, on global, uh, more broader levels, European levels. Um, and maybe one uh, final word, the cost of the transition, uh, which is pretty rough, are, are estimated to be lower than those of German reunification. So it will not be cheap, um, but uh, we have paid for other things before that were expensive. Um, here are some of the most recent studies analyzing a climate neutral energy system for Germany. Um, by the different actors I already mentioned, and the one with the red frame, I will, I will show you some of the results. Um, I will take this study for two reasons. First reason, I, I was part of the team which made the uh, study, and the other reason that was the first one really looking for complete climate neutrality and by 2045. That was before uh, the government decided to go for uh, 25 as a target. We, as the authors, were also a little bit uh, surprised that they basically took the data from the study for that target. Um, so um, this is German greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to 2050. Um, and uh, here you can see that in 1990, greenhouse gas emissions were uh, um, um, over 1,000 million tons in Germany uh, by the different sector, energy sector, uh, with all the coal uh, very big. And you can see that uh, until 2020, Germany uh, reduced uh, emissions already significantly. You can also see between 1990 and 2000, due to German unification, uh, there has been a uh, big success. Uh, on average, uh, we reduced emissions by 17 million tons per year. Um, and then, if we look at the targets and want to be climate neutral in 2045, we almost have to double that to 30 million tons of CO2 equivalents per year, or from 1.4 to 2.4% uh, per year. So that's uh, um, quitting pretty much of high ambition. So double the speed that we had in the past of uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. And here you can see it is, of course, important not only to look for uh, the final target, but also to look for 2030 as the end of this decade. And we think we need to achieve minus 65% reductions versus 90, uh, 90 by 2030 in Germany. So. Oh, where's my, ah, that works. Um, <clears throat> so what are the core mechanisms? And we um, somehow group the mechanisms into these two timeframes, the one until 2030 and the next uh, until 2045. And you can see all the sectors have to contribute. However, largest greenhouse gas emissions come still in the first period from the energy sector with over 200 million tons to be reduced. And of course, coal phase out by 2030 would be one of a very important uh, measure, but of course, ramping up of renewables and a lot of other measures as well. Second and third are transport and industry, lots of electric vehicles and an in industry introduction of a couple of breakthrough technologies by 2030. So uh, DRI based steel making, uh, with com which comes with coal phase out in the steel industry, um, deployment of green hydrogen for many applications in the sector, high building retrofit rates, but also reductions in agricultural sector and waste sectors. After 2030, um, the uh, <clears throat> sequence uh, swaps. So industry will be the largest contributor uh, following on the track to um, novel breakthrough technologies, particularly in energy intensive industries, but also uh, adding carbon capture and storage in cement industry, for example, and in other energy intensive sectors. Um, energy sector uh, will finally reduce uh, the rest of the emissions. Transport sector will carry on with electrification. Building sector will carry on agriculture. Uh, um, now with very significant greenhouse gas emissions and waste as well. And then finally, we will end up with some 95% per, uh, percent of emission greenhouse gas emission reductions. And so uh, in that scenario, uh, we will employ um, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage, mainly in industry, direct, carbon, uh, direct uh, air capture, carbon and 
carbon storage <laughs> and green polymers to compensate for remaining emissions, which are mainly in cement industry, uh, some other process industries, and particularly in agriculture. Um, and um, also uh, and some other measures will be in that. Uh, I come to this very quickly. Here you see uh, different core strategies, how we have to ramp up, for example, renewables. So um, by 2030, they have to be added um, 17,000 um, megawatt per year in um, photovoltaics uh, wind. Uh, that has to be uh, to increase further um, to by uh, after 2030, particularly when we want to achieve the target already in 2045. Um, we have to uh, invest lots in uh, water electrolysis to hydrogen, um, then uh, in buildings phase out as of gas, uh, phase in of heat pumps and district heating, um, strong building retrofit rates of 1.5 and, and then uh, increasing percent per year. Um, in agriculture, you can see that particularly after 2030, we also need uh, changes in, in meat and dairy consumption um, and uh, other uh, aspects like peatland production have to be carried out, out as well. In the transport sector, electric passenger cars are important, uh, but also um, hydrogen uh, for trucks will play a significant role. And in industry, we will see besides electrification and hydrogen, also carbon capture and storage, uh, particularly in the combination with bioenergy in order to uh, uh, compensate for remaining emissions in agriculture. Um, this is the picture for carbon capture and storage. So for the compensation, you see on the left side uh, where the residual emissions uh, will be in 2045. So agricultural sector is dominating, but also some industry processes and some waste incineration. And that will be offset by um, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage in industry mainly, because in the power sector, there will not be that high energy demand, thermal energy demand anymore. But um, in the energy sector, particularly, there will be direct air capture and CCS uh, to compensate also roughly 20 million tons of CO2. So that's for the remaining 5% here, this picture. Um, I go to some core strategies. Uh, that may uh, resonate a little bit with what's, uh, what was already presented by um, Nadja. Um, the electrification um, will almost double. So we will uh, increase electricity demand from some uh, 600 terawatt hours to almost 1,000 uh, terawatt hours a year in Germany. And um, that will be almost completely renewable and the rest will be storage and hydrogen, which is, so, uh, so to say, indirect, directly produced with renewable energies or imported. Um, on the right side, you can see from which energies that will come. And you see that the largest source will be photovoltaics in 2045, um, wind onshore second largest and wind offshore third largest. Um, and you can see also on the bottom in, in pink uh, uh, net imports, Currently, Germany is a net exporter uh, of almost 10% of its electricity uh, that will not be maintained. Um, there are rather but small net imports in the scenario. Um, hydrogen will also play an important role. Uh, so if you have in mind that we see some 1,000 terawatt hours uh, of electricity, um, we see in 2045, 265 terawatt hours of hydrogen in the country. Um, that starts a lot with industry in 2030. So um, basic chemicals, uh, particularly steel industry, will be early consumers. Um, then transport sector will consume up to 39 terawatt hours in 2045, the blue field. Um, and increasingly, the energy sector itself will need uh, um, hydrogen basically for, for buffering fluctuating generation in, in uh, respective uh, turbines for electricity generation. And where will the hydrogen come from? As already mentioned, uh, one of the strategies is to ramp up hydrogen generation in the country. 
but that will only account for roughly one third of the hydrogen uh, demand needed. The rest uh, will have to be uh, imported from abroad. And I can show you slightly this picture. That's a European uh, scenario, and that's by region, uh, the green electricity balance in a climate neutrality scenario. And there you can see that many parts of Germany and, and the Benelux region uh, are uh, net negative, so they are in, in red colors. They need to import energy, and that will, of course, a lot of that will come in the form of electricity from the North Sea, will be connected by a European grid, and there might be pipeline imports or even ship imports from green uh, hydrogen from the east, from the north, and from the south. And um, so, uh, in, in geopolitical terms, uh, given that these imports via pipeline then stand for a uh, um, complete reduction of um, fossil uh, imports of oil, natural gas, and also coal, uh, we could speak of a regionalization of the energy system of Germany in that case. Um, and less global connections uh, will be seen most probably here. Um, and that is also reflected in, in the import, uh, energy import numbers. You can see in energy terms, imports drop significantly by 84% from 2019 to 2045. That's another study, but with pretty similar results. And uh, uh, in monetary terms, um, energy imports will roughly uh, half between 2019 to 2045. So uh, let me briefly uh, um, <clears throat> summarize the core strategies for climate neutrality that, that we see on the demand side, strong energy efficiency strategy, which reduces final energy demand by over 40%, strong electrification in all sectors, which leads to 50% electricity in final demand and a doubling uh, electricity uh, demand and generation low carbon breakthroughs in industry, which are rapidly implemented together with quick ramping up of green hydrogen. And we also see some land use and nutrition changes in the scenario. And on the supply side, um, early coal phase out would be crucial, doubling of electricity production, switch to 100% renewable electricity generation by almost tripling dom domestic construction of PV and wind. Strong expansion of hydrogen supply with two thirds of it imported and negative emissions for the rest of the energy system. So uh, that's in a nutshell how a group of scenarios and in rather uh, comparable terms see how Germany could translate to a climate neutral energy system. Thanks a lot. So, and I try to. Oh, come thanks back. a lot. That was. Uh... Very interesting uh, for everybody, I think, to, to see how you picture this global transition for uh, Germany. And uh, I think this, this raises a lot of questions likely we will discuss later, because it's interesting the difference between what you presented and what uh, Nadia presented. And perhaps uh, now it's your turn to give us um, a picture beyond the strict energy transition. Hélène. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Jean-Charles, and thanks for, uh, for having me in this, uh, in this event. So I was asked to uh, talk a little bit, uh, to zoom out, basically, from Germany, France, and the energy systems to, more broadly, the climate scenarios. And I'm basing uh, my slides mainly on the one and a half degrees report by the IPCC, which was published uh, already three years ago, and to which uh, Jean-Charles was also an, uh, an author. Um, so I'm Helene de Koning. I work for Eindhoven University of Technology, where I'm a professor of socio-technical innovation and climate change. And I was a coordinating lead author in the One and a Half Degrees report, and also a coordinating lead author in the IPCC mitigation report that uh, Nadia is also uh, a part of. So what we see here is uh, uh, also in the summary for policymakers of the One and a Half Degrees report. It's the global pathway of CO2-only emissions. Uh, over the rest of this century until 2100, starting from 2010. And if you focus on the, the blue lines there, those are the uh, scenarios modeled by integrated assessment models. 
uh, that are consistent with limiting warming to one and a half degrees. So they give um, about 50 to 50% uh, 50 to two thirds chance of limiting warming to one and a half degrees with limited or no overshoot of that temperature level uh, over the course of the century. So if we want to limit climate risks, it makes uh, sense to focus on these scenarios. Now they have a couple of characteristics. Uh, one is that they halve CO2 emissions globally by 2030 compared to 2010 levels, also co compared to roughly current levels. Um, they have to be net zero CO2 emissions in 2050. And this is CO2 uh, only. Uh, we also looked at other greenhouse gases, but there the difference between one and a half and two degrees was, uh, was basically negligible. We already reduced those methane and N2O emissions uh, maximally also in two degree scenarios. And thirdly, we will need CO2 removal in the second half of this century to compensate for earlier emissions that were higher than we wanted and also to compensate for remaining emissions uh, still in the system. Now, it's important to realize that these are global numbers. So uh, they apply for, for every country uh, in the world on average. Um, we agreed in the Paris Agreement uh, that uh, rich countries would act a little bit earlier than, um, than poor countries um, because there are more capabilities, more resources, uh, more possibilities to act and also there's a greater historic responsibility. So in that sense, Germany's target of uh, cl climate neutrality or carbon neutrality in 2045 makes sense and maybe we should even go earlier than that. As, uh, as richer countries. Um, so these sort of emission pathways globally are so steep. They amount to eight, nine percent of annual emission reductions uh, for the next couple of decades that we're saying in the one and a half degrees report that it's not enough to implement a list of technologies or policy instruments. We really need systemic transitions in order to make this happen. And we identify four of them um, in the one and a half degrees report. And these are transitions that are needed both for mitigation and for adaptation. Because in a one and a half degrees report, uh, um, world and also in a two degrees world, we need strong adaptation as well. And those are also uh, systemic transitions that are needed. So first we heard about the energy uh, system transition amounting to more than just implementing the technologies. Also, as Nadia and also Stefan said, uh, we need societal changes to accommodate that. We need market, market regulation uh, to change there as well. Maybe, you know, changes in how we view our use of, uh, of energy. Secondly, we need land and ecosystem transitions responsible for about a third of global uh, emissions. Um, our, uh, everything related to our food systems and how we change our, our land. Uh, this needs to change, uh, needs to adapt to climate change, but also change from a source of emissions to uh, preferably a sink of CO2 emissions. We need systemic transitions in industry, and Stefan particularly talked about that, how we use our materials, how our industries uh, function. So this relates a lot to the circular economy as well. And finally, we need system transitions in urban and infrastructure systems, uh, both to adapt again to climate change, but also how our mobility works, how our buildings work, and uh, that relates to much more than only uh, electric vehicles or, uh, or heat pumps in buildings. It also relates to how we organize our cities um, and, and how we, uh, how, what our demand for mobility uh, will be. Now, uh, when we wrote the one and a half degrees report, we didn't really have the literature to assess the feasibility of these system transitions. Because of course we want to know, are they feasible? Can we actually do this? Can we accelerate these uh, system transitions? So we had to refer to literature that is more limited on the individual options. And within that literature, we looked at feasibility across six dimensions. Um, our method was that within each of these dimensions we had a number of indicators and we looked at the literature for different uh, individual mitigation and adaptation options and looked and sort of added up what the global feasibility of this was. It's quite a coarse exercise but it, uh, it gives some insight. 
So we looked at technological feasibility and economic feasibility, uh, and um, uh, of course, in terms of cost, distributional effects, technological maturity. We also looked at sociocultural feasibility. Are people generally accepting these um, these options? Um, uh, does it, is there a match with, uh, with, with culture? Institutional feasibility includes how easy it is to regulate things and whether a lot of changes need to be made and also includes something on the political side of things and also on capabilities. Geophysical feasibility relates to what is the potential for this particular option. Is there enough wind available or is there geological storage uh, um, capacity, for instance? And finally, environmental feasibility. We try to look across value chains also at um, the, uh, the need for resources and what, uh, what impacts those have, for instance, water or, um, or toxicity. Now, if we apply this uh, to the different options that we looked at, and this is just a summary of a number of mitigation options. Um, these are only 10, we had 28, and then also 25 adaptation options. And this, again, gives a very coarse overview. Uh, the way you should read this uh, is the darker the color, the lower the barriers, or the higher the feasibility. So a very light colored um, cell means that there are a lot of barriers. And a completely white cell means there was not enough literature to make this particular assessment for this particular option and dimension combination. And if you look at the energy options uh, that are listed here at the top, we, uh, we just took P solar PV and power sector carbon dioxide capture and storage as examples. You see that uh, we estimate generally lower barriers for solar PV. Uh, just some remaining barriers in some areas in the world in terms of uh, institutional and geophysical um, feasibility. Very important is also the final column here, which is context, because this is a global assessment. So uh, we really need to contextualize it. It depends often on the specific circumstances in a country or in a region, uh, and that affects very much the feasibility of this, uh, this option. Overall, the assessment uh, used about 1,500 literature references. It was all literature-based, uh, as IPCC reports uh, always are. Uh, so it's a very rich exercise, and it really gives you an idea of for, as a policymaker, where you would um, look first on, in terms of barriers to, uh, to address, and where do we don't know enough yet. Uh, we also did a similar thing for, and you see it here at the bottom, for uh, several carbon dioxide removal options, which is really uh, a set of options that we, we need in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees, at least to some degree. Uh, and Stefan also talks about that. And there you see that those are much earlier in their uh, implementation phase. So there are way more barriers here. There's much less known about these uh, types of options. So there's a lot of work to be done in order to make this uh, um, happen. So um, going back to the system transitions, the question is how do we uh, make them happen? And we identified six enabling conditions that would need to be fulfilled, all of them, in order to uh, help these system transitions and accelerate them. And I'll quickly go through them and then I'll, uh, I'll be done. So um, I'll start at the, at the, um, uh, the, the top right. Um, behavioral change is one of those uh, conditions. We need uh, um, people who um, who are changing their ways, who are, for instance, lowering energy demand, but also who are accepting technologies um, and also who are um, supporting political action, uh, so through voting, for instance. Lower right finance, uh, we separated them from that from policy instruments. The financial sector has quite a different role to play, so we need investors who invest in the right kinds of options. Then to policy instruments, we, uh, of course, government intervention is, uh, is very important. Um, we uh, emphasize carbon pricing, but also always in combination with other instruments. By itself, it cannot do the job. Obviously, we need technological innovation in order to lower costs and bring new technologies uh, forward. Uh, and also for that, we have a number of policy options. We need multi-level governance, uh, policies across different levels of government, and also more collaboration between different sectors and between government levels. And finally, something that is often not mentioned, but we made a point of really mentioning it here, is that we need much more capacity globally. We need way more people who know what they're doing, who have the capacity to analyze, the capacity to uh, install uh, new technologies, 
uh, within government, um, uh, with, uh, within factories who take the initiative to really make these, uh, these changes. And this is uh, already a, a gap in developed countries, but the gap is even bigger in developing countries. And it, that's why it's good that this is uh, high on the agenda here at the COP uh, meetings as well. So this is just a quick, very high level summary of, uh, of part of the one and a half degrees report of uh, IPCC. Thank you for your attention. Over to you, Jean-Charles. Thank you very much. So um, I will perhaps rebound on, uh, we have about 30 minutes. Uh, I will make my own reaction on that and come back to you. Uh, I jump with, the, with what you just said. Okay, because we work together for the IPCC and for the um, and for this uh, GCF report, and the, the same question I have in mind when I hear um, uh, Nadia and, uh, and Stefan. Today we have a huge problem in the world to help people to understand each other because we are very, very, very divided. What what happens in this context? Okay, is not very. Um, optimistic about the capacity we have to build something. And when you showed your remark about the enabling conditions, well, you pardon me, that that's obvious that we know each other and uh, this can be said. We wrote a lot together, but instinctively, I don't write exactly the same thing than, 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 than her, than, than, uh, than uh, Ellen. Uh, but at the end, we succeed to have something. The question is that, for example, I can interpret the colon of the and I mean conditions, I say, hey, yes, we can do it, the, uh, the 1.5. I can also say, my instinct, Ola, <laughs> this so complex will never succeed. And that's important that for the next step, we try to be clear about that because I think we, we are in a difficult position now for the climate story because we have a lot of movement in favor of, 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 of uh, climate policies, but there are all, all also a lot of potential for, for social divisions. So that's important that, that, that we organize, and I think this was very helpful for me. And then the one key example is France and Germany. Why that? You know, the President of the Republic, uh, M. Macron, yesterday announced that we will relaunch the nuclear program in France. Okay? Fine. This means that Likely, in a while, we will uh, reform, redo, the law, the, the energy transition law in France, has required, required that we should cut back the role of the nuclear, the share of the nuclear program to 50%. Okay? And now, no, I say, oh, well, likely we'll have to go up. After all, that's fine, okay. But the problem is that in the, in the, political, the political context in France, all the opposition, or, or at least on the right wing, white, senior white, okay, fine. Worse than that, so it's not only we have the, uh, the nuclear, but the wind energy that's awful. And they organize, there is a social re resistance to the wind energy. Which surprises me because, frankly, I'm, I'm not totally fond of the idea of 100% renewable, I'm more skeptical, okay? But I don't understand why. I, I, I know the story, but you have a social r resistance against wind energy by people who share regions in France. Difficult to organize a 100% transition with that. So the question is how this happens? And I will not give you the response, but something which is very important amongst ourselves I was young when, when uh, Louis Prison was under Boiteux. Boiteux was the head of Electricity France who organized the, the, the nuclear power uh, in France, okay? And Boiteux was a dissident. He came to the CIRED. It was in 77, 6, 7, 8. In France, the anti-nuclear movement was as important that, than in uh, Germany. Not, it was isolated politically, but there was, but, you know that there was a bifurcation. And, and Pisa said, oh la la, I suspect that the nuclear program will become a division line between Germany and France. And, and, this, and, and this is true. 
And what happens now in France, they will say, well, the German, they, they, poof, they are foolish, totally. They believe in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in renewable energy. The French are right, and we uh, will relaunch likely, uh, perhaps not, but we will relaunch the, the nuclear program. I, I'm also a lot of critics about that. But to tell you that you have a social reflex for a long time embedded in the, in the mindset of the elites in each country, simply to say that we have to to, to discuss together our, our role as scientists, not to be in pavilion to say, well, we are neutral. No, no. To help people to, to, underst to, uh, underst to understand each other. And, as a, and then I, I will make a provocation for you, Stefan. After all, I can say, I play the French there, OK? Uh, OK. We'll do the nuclear program. The German will say, we are clean. We have 100% uh, uh, renewable energy and all the interdependencies, all the problems of, okay, will be made by the, by, by, the, by the nuclear. I mean, the French will provide the basic energy for the rest of Europe. It's a semi-caricature, okay? But it's important that the, the, when you, in your chart, okay, when you show the imports, import, there are a lot of political issues beyond that. And the, to tell you what I think, uh, my, my instinct is not to be neutral, is that what is dangerous now in France, I can tell you what I think, is that all, we have two options. I, either we say the list of questions raised by Nadia makes that we are right to follow the nuclear route, or we say no, the other option is to work, to develop e innovations, to have more re re reliable grid system, who accept more intermittencies and so on and so forth. The, the question that e here you have a, a division line, which is uh, perhaps one of Big, little problem in Europe in the future. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's it's bon. Bon. Okay, uh, so then, then I, <laughs> I go on. Uh, so um, I think there are two things. Nadia uh, had uh, many uh, uh, critical issues on renewable energies, and uh, we can, of course, discuss them all. Um, I think most of those issues are discussed. And, and for example, flexibility of the system, all these things is modeled in the German uh, scenarios. Um, so that, that's not uh, naive in, in that context. Um, and it's also, it's not relying on uh, French nuclear to be flexible, uh, which at least in the past it was not. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but right. anyway, um, that, um, so there, there is, of course, lots of reflection. Although uh, the renewable energy system is, is also not easy, comes with its challenges. Um, uh, let me make an, uh, another point. Then we can discuss nuclear. Um, no, we, we don't discuss nuclear, <laughs> better not. Uh, but let me make one other point. I, you pointed also to society. I mean, if we go to renewable energy, uh, um, we are pretty confident that is technically feasible, that is geophysically uh, feasible, as Helen pointed it out. Uh, the main points, main problems are institutional and societal. There, there we are. St we still have and see problems there, and therefore it's so important. I showed you the list of studies um, that may all be elite that's discussing that. That's typically very much the point in these uh, discussions. Uh, but anyway, um, there are different groups from different parts of the society. And we are discussing also, also with the trade unions, uh, maybe not with the far right, because uh, uh, they think there is no climate uh, problem at all. Um, but um, so it's important to have a wide societal uh, debate and, and bring these things forward. And there I see constructive uh, things in Germany, constructive debates. I also think many industries are pushing for green industry because they are really aware that they will only have a chance on the market with green products. So they, they need really uh, green energy for that. And so that's, uh, that's an important driver we now have. And so I think this, this societal uh, debate is very important. And maybe last point, in Germany at least, the debate around nuclear has paralyzed almost everything. So the decision on nuclear energy, you may discuss that uh, in, in uh, energy economic terms. I, I, uh, I think it was a good decision, but in, in societal terms, it was an extremely wise discussion because it opened up all the societal power and the societal discourse for alternatives to it. 
and before we just discussed can renewables with nuclear or not and all these things and back and forth and so it was extremely important helpful and set uh, free lots of energy in the society to go forward that we had a clear decision we are out of nuclear but that's a german situation no, but that's in, to, 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 totally interesting we don't have to stick with the franco-german story that's uh, that's, uh, that's fine <laughs> Um, probably economic feasibility of nuclear is pretty high, but I think the way we assess the literature, and you remember that, uh, Jean-Charles, uh, Jean in the One and a Half Degrees report, and also the studies I've seen afterwards on the Netherlands, they actually indicate that, especially because the investment costs are so high, it's hard to find investors for it if you don't have a, a public entity um, making sure there's you know, guarantees uh, for it. And because the share of variable renewables in the grid is so much higher, so your nuclear power plant is not on for 8,000 hours a year anymore, right? Because the uh, wind and solar get preference on the grid. Um, so that means your, your economic viability of your nuclear plant also uh, becomes lower, especially if you keep on sticking to very large scale um, uh, uh, nuclear uh, power plants. If you would go, but that takes more innovation to uh, modular reactors, which could innovate more quickly, costs could, could come down more quickly, you could, you could maybe use that. But I think e economic feasibility is not necessarily assessed as very high because, um, uh, I mean, technological maturity, yes, but economic feasibility not ne necessarily because in the system, which is going more variable renewable, uh, it's not necessarily an, an, an for the market attractive uh, option. We actually also discussed in the one and a half degrees report the literature on this 100% renewables. Can we do it with wind, water, and solar? Right? There was a big discussion in the literature on that, with some researchers stating yes, it's absolutely possible, and others not. So we gave ba both sides of the of the, of the story. Uh, and sort of left it in the middle. IPCC is not prescriptive, so we didn't uh, pass judgment on that. Um, uh, I, I tend to think that, I mean, completely wind and solar is going to be tough, so you need some kind of a, a, a backup, in, uh, whether it's a lot of storage or whether it's biomass and other options, geothermal imports, uh, uh, maybe nuclear if, if your country uh, wants it, maybe some gas with CCS is even in, in some of those scenarios. So that's also still uh, still uh, a, a, a possibility. So I think 100% renewables, the topic of this event, in none of the IPCC scenarios that is actually happening in 2050 globally. Uh, I would like to, to go back to, uh, to Nadia, but to be clear, the 100% that we launched, and Nadia launched that in practice in France, is an heuristic exercise, which is fine. We, you say we, we do that to see how to what extent that's possible. And now to, to a very brief, brief thing, and then I would like to, to, to come back to, uh, to Nadia. Uh, this question of, of uh, the nuclear war, where this question of cultural divide is really important. I wrote, it was, it was quoted, a paper a long time ago to demonstrate, frankly, that after all, the, the nuclear response in France macroeconomically was not that efficient compared with Germany, uh, Italy, and so on, so I'm not. The question is typically the question of the cutting out of the capital cost and so on and so forth. I don't say this is bad, but it's not as good as some, some, somebody say. The question is, is how, how to manage the social debate internal to each country and the cross country so that all these questions are put on the table and the, root, the roots are not selected in, in uh, uh, under, under hypnosis, I would say. So, but that's also how the, debat the democratic debate is, is organized uh, in each country, that's complicated, but simply to say that's, that's right. Well, Nadia, we have 15 minutes, so don't say that you have to talk every time, but I, have, I think because I know what you, 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 you have in mind and you develop uh, only partially, I discovered this last month, thanks to you, mm -hmm. the real technicality in terms of, of physical obstacles posed by this question of intermittency, but uh, um, also the sparse uh, energy, all these type of things, including the, 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 the question posed by, over the long run, uh, by the digitalization. That's always 
I don't like this figure. Where so we are the total world with BP. Okay, <laughs> we, we we saw that including for in, uh, uh, in the past. But this is a very important question. I think this, uh, frankly, I think I'm not the, the less informed in the world. But we during these months, I learned a lot. Um, I learned a lot from what what I've uh, heard from you, and that you can simply help people to understand better. Uh, this question of, f of uh, physical barriers and, uh, and, and challenges, for example, to change the, the type of digitalization. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to take the risk of trying to explain this in the time left, but just I would like to comment what has been said by Hélène and Stefan. Um, the debate uh, has to go beyond uh, technical choices that have been made uh, by Germany and by France uh, because they're connected to political context and to societal issues uh, that uh, are um, un undiscutable here. And uh, so the, the, the point I, I want to come back, and I will come back to your question, uh, on is the fact that I think that developed countries are able to sustain any technical mix. They just have to choose one path. As you say, Stefan, you phase out from nuclear. Now it's clear. And now you will find solution because you're a developed country with uh, many engineers and so on and so forth. And so I think the problem is, and in France, we will do, OK, we go back to nuclear. I didn't know that. I didn't hear Macron yesterday, but it's yesterday. OK, it's yesterday. good. It's, it's OK, it's all right. We, we, can, we can sustain any choice. And the point is not that. The point is, is that renewable target something that is uh, wishable that w is really going in the right direction. This is the point I would like to question here. And as you, uh, you said, there are externalities. So I didn't see, Elaine, in your, um, in your tabular, the externalities, mm -hmm. any column talking about externalities. And I didn't see neither any column talking about the question of, um, I'm not a country alone on the planet. The problem is a problem for everybody. Even if Germany is clean and France is clean, the problem is not solved. <laughs> I mean, there are many, many people around and these people want to live and want to have the lifestyle that they see on all the uh, cables that uh, provide these uh, stupid, uh, 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 movies and so on and so forth. So how do we solve that? And I believe that we don't have to uh, bring on the table solutions that are not affordable for the others. All the questions of uh, reliabilities, uh, as you said, Stefan, are now taking into account in the scenarios. You have the solutions, we have the solutions, it's going to cost a little more. It's going to be touchy in a technological point of view. But are all the countries uh, uh, capable of raising this level of technicity? You mentioned that you have now just to import hydrogen. And I've seen this uh, <laughs> arrow going to North Africa. I'm sorry, I'm coming from North Africa. There is a huge problem of energy right there. And if we don't solve the problem there, we cannot think about these people exporting anything to the north. Because we need to, to, to solve the problem everywhere at the same time. Not the north is going to tell, yeah, people, it's feasible. Just come on. Because these people would be dead at the time <laughs> you have finished your super 100% renewable system. 
So that's the point I want to raise. The, the feasibility is not only technical. It's not about acceptability because it's very nice to bike, to bicycle in Germany. Did you try to bicycle in Algeria? I would like to invite you and just to show you that it, this is just impossible. So we need to get out from this point of view where what you see, where you live, is applicable everywhere. It's not, and if your choice becomes a problem somewhere else, your choice, even if you prove me that it's a good choice in terms of the criteria that you have, it is not, it is not. So this is what we wanted to, to, to raise in this uh, seminar, uh, trying to say, because there was publication about 100% renewable in France by some colleagues, and, 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 and we wanted to not to tell, no, 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 we're against that, and not to focus the debate, as you said, uh, between pro and against nuclear power and this and that, because it's, it's a stupid problem, you know, at the, at the scale of the planet. It's like just German and French people are talking always about that, but uh, regarding the, 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 the huge question of climate change, this is a, a small, small issue. And so one point, and the one that you raise, is the fact that this uh, digital transition everybody's talking about, is going to lead us in the, uh, in the wall, and nobody's talking about that. So I think that even if you have solved the problem, the technical problem about iNature, synchronism, we uh, pretend that um, digital is free, free of everything. It's like you, you just send an email, and by a magical uh, thing, it doesn't have any externality. And this is false, and I think this is uh, the next problem people will have to face. And uh, when you say we have solved and we have put in the scenarios all the uh, technical questions you raised, yes, today. But if we take five years ago, it was not the case. And so we were a very small uh, amount of people talking about that, and they were telling that we were just uh, trying to find problems where they are not. And today, there are a few people around me, I'm not working on this, this digitalization issues, but uh, uh, people that are trying to evaluate, assess the carbon footprint of this, not only in terms of consumption, but in terms of calculation, what computing costs, and it costs a lot, <coughs> and we are using that as if it's free. And so, mm, we need to be careful because we can have, I don't know how to say this in English, le retour de bâton, it's gonna hit us. The bug. Yeah, so this is what I had to No, 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 that's, I, I wanted you to come back to that because, uh, because I discovered yeah. that's, that's really the, the new challenge. Mm. Oh, wait, wait, that's, uh, uh, we are approaching to the, to the end of our, our perhaps a last reaction to, to, for, for um, uh, Stefan, but the, the, going back to this question of, of uh, scenarios and democracy, and uh, simply to, in this Franco-German, to, to say, uh, when, for example, Nadia says, we don't have to, s to sell, I would say, to impose, to, s to dream that the others will, will, will recap what we are doing and so on. Uh, historically, not only the French, the French and the US, huh? wanted to use the nuclear power as a solution for the, de for the de developing countries. And, and one of my second PhD thesis was to deconstruct the prospect of the International, international uh, Atom Agency who predicted four, four, eight, five thousand gigawatt installed in developing countries in, in 2000. So there was a, 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 a utopia to a nuclear power as the solution for the world. And I think that we, have, we don't have to repeat the same thing with the clean energy. We have simply to start from the, from the society. This simply, that's a, to see is not, uh, the, the same reflex exists in, in, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, at uh, every point in time. That's m more or less the same. So I know if you want to, to have a, 
Each of you, yes, yes, go. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, um, I'm completely <laughs> agree, and and we try to capture that in the one and a half degrees report, and you'll see much more about it in the mitigation report. So I'm a CLA of the chapter on technology, mm -hmm. and it's a lot about the problems of technology, <laughs> which is exactly what you because we, especially in the north, right? We try, we tend to focus on technological solutions because we're used to think that way. These solutions will be very different depending on the context, on where you are. It will be different in Algeria compared to Peru, compared to the US. Netherlands and Germany are very different even. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you know, to look at your transport system and say, okay, we're gonna, for the Netherlands, you know, replace our eight million cars with eight million electric vehicles. In your flat. Uh, without looking at the mobility system as such and, and actually without regarding what the lithium mining for all these batteries is doing to uh, uh, to indigenous people in Argentina, you know, um, yeah. So that that's a huge issue, yeah. and I and the digitalization the same thing, right? We're building wind parks in the mo at the moment in the Netherlands, to uh, and basically all the all the uh, power is is bought or at least a sizable part of it is bought by new data centers. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and why we were building these <laughs> wind uh, to match our own electricity demand, not to build more new. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a huge, uh, it's huge. I just wanted to, uh, to second that every country has its own story, needs to make its own decisions, and needs to have its own capacity to make those own decisions. And we're back to that puzzle piece of capacity uh, development, institutional capacity, because I think there's a huge gap there. Um, because there's so f little capacity, especially in developing countries, the space in the debate is taken up by the more technological focused northern perspectives. Right. And that is a big problem. Mm. In the scientific literature, it, to some degree in IPCC reports, although we're trying our best to change that, uh, and also here in this uh, COP form. Mm. This might be a conclusion, but I don't want to, mm. to, to, to <laughs> get without uh, asking uh, Stephanie, you have something I, to, uh, because I'm very interested by, by, uh, by what you said about the fact that uh, Germany has a good capacity of mobilization of its uh, its uh, industry, and nevertheless you have still problems of acceptation by the uh, by the population. That's uh, so you have one. No, no, may, maybe briefly, as as uh, I think we we are almost uh, on uh, on the end. Um, I think it's a, it's of course clear we have to uh, look uh, for all the challenges of technology, uh, for material issues and all these things. But I think we do that. That's many of these scenarios do that, and it's not an argument against one or the other solution. Uh, so um, I really, uh, that holds true, I think, as well for nuclear as for renewables. So we look, should look for it. And uh, the digitization, by the way, also. So um, that's not an argument against doing anything. It's, it's an argument of doing it careful. Uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, socially acceptable uh, in a just uh, way, uh, good for the uh, South and the North. So um, I think that's, that's not really the point uh, of discrimination between the, those two energies. Um, I would like to discuss that <laughs> when we have more time, we can do that. No, no, no. Um, but uh, so I think uh, it's important to start and, and to go into all these uh, tricky things of these solutions. And we already did that. And uh, I think it's important to go ahead on that way in a constructive manner and would like to contribute together with you. <laughs> Thank you. But I was not arguing for the nuclear. Right? I was simply, simply saying that we have this problem. So I have 20 seconds to say hello to uh, everybody. And thanks, uh, Nadia, uh, to have... Uh, make a representation and you and and uh, and then we have 10 seconds so we have perhaps perhaps we, the best way what should we say five six four two three <laughs> and then zero and thank you thank you